Hi, so in this video we're going to look at elections and voting systems from a mathematical perspective. We're going to look at different types of voting systems, i.e. different rules for how you turn the preferences of voters into a winner in an election, looking at uh, the pros and cons of different ones and which ones could be considered fair or, fairer or, or less fair than others. Uh, and uh, I'm going to motivate a little bit about why that's important and uh, with some examples of UK uh, elections. I'm going to make a second video which also proves Arrow's theorem, which is a famous theorem about elections and voting systems afterwards, so watch out for that one if you're, uh, if you're interested. But let's start, why is this important? So here's an example of an election that happened reasonably recently in the United Kingdom for the seat of Brecon and Radnorshire uh, on the 1st of August 2019, and we can see here that the Liberal Democrats won this seat uh, with 13,800 votes, Conservatives came a close second with 12,400, followed by the Brexit Party with 3,300 votes. Now, in the UK, for each individual uh, member of Parliament who uh, sits in the House of Commons, we have a first-past-the-post system to elect them. What that means is here the Liberal Democrats candidate Jane Dodds has won because she has the most votes, and that's that. So she didn't get more than 50% of the vote, she got 43% of the vote, but it was more than anyone else so that's enough for her to be elected. Now some people will look at uh, a result like this and say, well, on the other hand, you know, if we really uh, want a fair system here, perhaps people who voted for the Conservatives and the Brexit Party maybe share views more than others. So actually between them they got 15,700 votes and would have beaten the, the Liberal Democrats on their own. Now, the Liberal Democrats might also say they would have taken some of those votes uh, from the Brexit Party or Labour if people's second choices were taken uh, into account. Um, but the fact of the matter is here, even if actually all of these other people would have preferred uh, you know, the Conservatives over the, over the Liberal Democrats, like the people that voted for the Brexit Party, the people that voted for Labour, say, or UKIP, or all the others here, um, that stuff doesn't get taken into account. Um, this often happens with other... Uh, ways around as well. You know, sometimes the Conservatives win a seat, and actually, you know, Labour and the Liberal Democrats are both close behind. And some people argue that, uh, you know, if you put the Labour, you know, Labour and Liberal Democrat voters might maybe are closer together in some ways, they would have beaten the Conservatives overall. But we have a first past the post system, so we just elect the the winner. Okay, um, and you know, you can see that uh, here. Here are the twenty seventeen UK general election results overall, and you can see that the vote share. Um, doesn't really correspond to the number of seats in Parliament. So, so this column here shows the number of seats that different uh, parties have won. So the Conservatives have 318 seats, Labour 262. The next biggest party here was the Scottish National Party with 35. Um, but the vote shares cha uh, you know, change wildly. For example, the, the Scottish National Party only got 3% uh, you know, of the vote here and got 35 seats, whereas the Liberal Democrats got 7.4% of the vote, and uh, they only get 12 seats. So, um, you know, uh, some people say this is unfair, it's not a proportional system, right? So, uh, the reason this happens is because the Scottish National Party get all of their votes in Scotland, so their votes are very concentrated in Scottish constituencies, and so they can win each of these individual first-past-the-post elections. Whereas the Liberal Democrats don't win as much in... Uh, seats across the uh, you know the country their sp their spread their vote is spread out so they get small numbers of votes in lots of different areas but not usually enough to win uh, a whole seat or not as often I, I live in Bath where there is a Liberal Democrat uh, MP in fact one of these twelve seats but that is very much the mi minority even though they've got you know more than double the number of votes of you know this uh, Scottish National Party they've only ended up with a third of the of the votes and many other smaller parties you know, can make uh, similar claims to the Green Party with half a million votes uh, gets just uh, one seat uh, in Brighton, I think. And, um, you know, so they've actually got more than half as many votes as the SNP, right, uh, who have 35 seats. Anyway, so the rules of elections are important, right? You know, seats like this one, Southampton Itchen in 2017, was one, this was the closest one I could find, was won by just 31 votes, you know, Conservative versus Labour. And I'm sure all of these other voters, Liberal Democrat, UKIP, Green voters, would have had a second preference. Actually, perhaps uh, it looks here like you know if we put Liberal Democrats and Green together, that's you know 2,000 votes, UKIP 1,000 votes. You can argue which way they would have gone for second choices, but it really would have made a difference. In some ways, you might argue that 
these people who voted Liberal Democrat, UKIP or Green have wasted their vote in a way in this in, in this election because um, you know, they voted for candidates that were that were never really going to win. Um, that's a more controversial issue that I'm not going to talk about. Um, we actually had a referendum on this question in 2011 about uh, whether the United Kingdom should change its voting system. Um, you know, it says, the, the, and there was a simple vote on whether to change this first past the vote post system to an alternative voting system. Uh, and uh, that election, that you know, that that alternative vote referendum actually lost by a significant margin. So we kept uh, the first past the post system. So what I want to talk about though is what what alternatives are there for deciding these sorts of elections. And what are their pros and cons? So, um, so firstly, what do we want from a voting system? Uh, arguably, we would like something that uh, can produce a decisive outcome. That's a really important uh, criteria. You know, we need to whatever rules we have for there to be a winner. I should say, I'm talking here just about these kind of constituency elections, like the lists I've just shown you of of candidates running to be an MP. Um, obviously, it gets a lot more complicated when you talk about uh, parliamentary rules and how. MPs then decide to form a government on who's prime minister and things. So I'm thinking here about just these individual uh, voting uh, systems in, in one election for now. Okay, so should prov prov produce a decisive outcome, should be fair and uh, representative, and hopefully be robust to manipulation, which means that um, you know people can't somehow get their way by voting for a second choice candidate rather than the one they want because of some sort of tactical reason. Uh, people should just be able to vote for who they want to and and then the system provide a fair outcome. That would be ideal. Um, so uh, the way we're going to analyze different voting systems is through these uh, preference lists. Okay, so uh, as I've said, we're going to consider simple elections like the ones that we've just been looking at for uh, for individual MPs, and we're going to have a preference profile for each election. So you can see this table here shows the preferences of different voters in an election. So what this so if you look at this first column here, you can see I've got five people. And there are four candidates here, you know, A, B, C, and D. And these five people are going to rank, you know, A first, C second, D third, and B fourth. Okay. And then there are seven people who have this preference, four people that have this preference. And so in this table, I can represent all of the voters uh, in my electorate. Now, it may be that the voting system doesn't use all of these preferences, right? In the first past the post system, we just look at the first choices of people, uh, of the candidates. But what we assume is that. Every voter does have a second, third, fourth choice right down to the end um, if they're asked for it. And so we could design a voting system using those preferences if we wanted to. So, um, so first past the post, under this uh, voting system, we just add up the first choice votes. We see here that uh, A uh, has five plus four uh, first choice votes. And so they get nine. B has uh, seven here. C has three. And then D has these five, and so A just wins, and that's it. Okay. So what else can we do? Um, the French, in their presidential elections, uh, use a runoff method, where uh, we look at the first choice votes uh, in the same way to begin with, and then we say, let's just take those first two candidates, uh, A and B, who've got nine and seven, and then we'll have a second round of voting uh, and see who wins between A and B. Uh, now, because I've got everyone's preferences, and I'm going to assume they don't change, uh, you know, from the first round to the second round here, um, I don't have to ask them to vote again here. I can just look down to their to their next preference, right? So here, uh, these five people um, that voted for A, of course, still prefer A over B. But if I look at, let's say, this column uh, here, then these people preferred B over A. So that column. Uh, now has three people voting for B over A. So just between A and B, we see here actually that A and B are tied. Uh, if you add up the first choices for A, there are 12, and the first choices for B now, there are 12 under the runoff. So we've got a different outcome from the election here. Um, arguably not a good one because there's a tie, uh, and it hasn't produced a winner. In fact, this isn't usually a problem in real elections because the number of voters is so high, it's incredibly rare that there's an exact tie between two candidates. In fact, it's much more common that you know if there's a if there's a sort of small margin of error between the candidates, say one is only one by five votes or something, that actually there might have to be a recount because there are usually spoiled ballots and things like that. So you can't actually so when people count up the votes uh, by hand, um, there's a bit of a margin for error, and and so that you know it may just lead to a recount, and you actually get a different result when you do a recount, usually with a large number. Anyway, 
that's that's slightly beside the point. So, um, so here's a, a another method and the alternative vote, um, which is a similar sort of system to the one that was proposed in the in the alternative vote referendum. There's a little bit more complexity to that uh, because of the whole system changing, but effectively it says something like this: Look at the first choice votes and look at who has the fewest first choice votes. So here, candidate C only had three, so they're eliminated because they've got the fewest first choice votes. So then I have a kind of runoff between all of the other candidates where I just eliminate C from this table and bump up the preferences of everyone else. Okay, so C's eliminated, but everyone's preferences for A, B and D stay in order. And in this revised system, B now has the fewest first choice votes, and so they're eliminated. Uh, so even though they made it to the runoff in between two people under this system, you see they now have fewer second, you know, in, in this system they have fewer first choice votes than D, so actually A and D now go to the final runoff, and in fact we see that D wins in this system um, because they now have 15 votes over uh, over A's 9. And this sort of thing happens a lot where you have you know, a candidate who gets a lot of first choice votes, but they're actually ranked quite low down the table uh, by everyone else, so they've got a few people who who it's their favourite, but then everyone else really dislikes them. Um, so arguably, maybe this is a fairer result because actually, you know, a lot of people here you can see have put, you know, D as their as their second choice or their first choice. So actually, most people are reasonably happy with D, um, even though most people wouldn't be very happy with A. So that's the alternative vote. Um, here's another way of looking at things: you could have a Condorcet method, right? So what does a Condorcet method do? Okay, it takes this same table. And uh, from this first preference profile, I can, I'm going to make a new table, and I'm effectively going to have those runoffs between every pair of candidates. Okay, so you can see, we've already seen that if A runs off against B, uh, we get a tie, 12 all, right? And I'm just doing that between every other pair of candidates. So we see between A and C here, uh, A wins 16, 8. Between A and D, D wins by 15 to 9, if I just look at the pairwise preferences in the table. Um, and what you can see when you analyze all of the candidates here is actually that D wins pairwise runoffs against every other candidate. So individually, the, the voters prefer D to A, they prefer D to B, and they prefer D to C. And that's what we mean by the Condorcet winner. So here, uh, D is a Condorcet winner, and so arguably, perhaps they should win the election. Um, there's a problem with this Condorcet winner method because, unfortunately, um, preference profiles have this property called non-transitivity, which you might have heard of in other areas of maths. What that means is it's possible to find preferences of voters, and it happens quite often in fact, for example this preference profile, where uh, if you look at the pairwise interactions, I'll let you check them, uh, pause the video, uh, you see that A beats B, B beats C, and C beats A. So actually there can be no Condor Condorcet winner because we have this non-transitivity, right? Transitivity is something we have, uh, you know, numbers where we say that, you know, 8 is bigger than 4, and 4 is bigger than 1. Actually, that means that 8 is bigger than 1, right? Uh, but here, we have that A is bigger than B, uh, and B is bigger than C in terms of preferences, but we don't have, uh, we don't have that A is bigger than C, we have C, C is bigger than A, in terms of if bigger than means winning. Okay, so this is a problem. Now, you can adapt Condorcet methods so that they, uh, you know, so that they have uh, this property, so you can turn it into a, a, a voting system where it has a winner, but in itself it's not going to be a criteria. Okay. But we can use this as a way of saying, here's a good criteria for uh, an election system. Right? If I make a more complicated election system, one thing I might like it to do is to satisfy this Condorcet winner criterion, which says that if there is a Condorcet winner, the system will choose that candidate as the winner. Okay. So in this example, uh, there is no Condorcet winner, so I can have I can I can still have this uh, system that satisfies the Condorcet criterion, you know, as long as uh, you know by, by setting up some other set of rules here. But if there was a Condorcet winner, like in the previous one where D was a Condorcet winner, uh, it would have to make D the winner if it's going to satisfy this Condorcet criterion. Um, and actually, interestingly, none of the voting systems that we've considered so far actually satisfy this criteria. So it's actually a very strong criteria and one that is quite hard to uh, to satisfy, certainly first past the post, um, you know, we've already seen um, clearly doesn't satisfy that criteria. Um, okay, but none of the others do either. 
a slightly weaker condition here, I guess we'd have a Condorcet loser condition, which says that uh, let's just make sure that if someone is a Condorcet loser, i.e. if they're a candidate who would lose a runoff against every other candidate, i.e. you know people prefer literally every other candidate to them, um, they can't win the election. And again, it's possible that the system doesn't have Condorcet losers, just like it can not have Condorcet winners sometimes. Uh, but uh, but this criteria would say would, would seem to be a reasonable thing um, to uh, to suggest. Now, one problem we have here actually with first past the post is it doesn't even satisfy the Condorcet loser criteria. Okay, so uh, you know, um, alternative vote does satisfy it, but you know, for first past the post, our current voting system, you know, it can be the case that. Uh, everybody hates the first choice candidate. Well, not everybody hates the first choice candidate, but you can have, let's say, you know, a third of people, you know, uh, vote for the first choice candidate and they win the election because they've got the most first choice votes. But actually, everyone else would place them as the last candidate they want uh, be, uh, out of all of the others. And so, actually, you know, more than half of the electorate prefer every other candidate to them. So, first past the post is a, is a big weakness here, in this sense. Um, Okay, last method I'm going to talk about uh, here is the po a points-based method. So this would be a, another sensible uh, voting method, and we could just look at people's whole preference profiles and actually say, well, why don't we take into account everything they think about the candidates? So let's say if a voter puts someone first, they get five points. Second, they get four points. Third, they get three points. The fourth, they get two points. Fifth, they get one point. Or you could change the number of points for the different levels here. Okay, so. Here's a, difference, here's a different preference profile uh, that we're going to look at. It has an interesting criteria property in a second. Uh, here I've got 36 people who have this uh, preference between these five candidates, etc. You know, and it works exactly as before, just with one extra candidate. And using this point system, I can say, OK, how many points should A get? Well, they've got 36 first choice votes, so they get 36 times 5. Actually, everyone else dislikes them here. You can see they've come last for everyone else. So for those 74 people, uh, they get one point, and that adds up to 254. And I can do the same for all of the other candidates that I haven't shown my working. But, you know, B gets five uh, points for each of these 24. Uh, here, for these 36, it gets one point because it comes last. For these 20, it's going to get four points, 80 in total, etc. And we add them all up. And we see here that under this system, uh, you can check the working, if you like, that... Uh, we get a winner of D. Right, D has the most points here with 382. You can see they don't actually get many first choice votes, um, but they do pretty well by getting lots of second, third, and fourth choice votes. Right? Now, uh, one issue with points-based systems is that the number of points uh, for the different rankings is clearly going to change the outcome. Okay, so uh, you know, for example, if I just made a million points for first choice preferences and, and very few points for the others we would effectively have a first-past-the-post system because first-choice votes are going to be so much more important than everything else. Okay, so, um, but but points-based systems, you know, could be, uh, could be used. So, the interesting thing about this particular preference profile, um, and uh, I uh, have taken this from a, a book called The Maths of Elections and Voting, which I'll link uh, by the Amazon store later, um, is that if we look at all the different voting systems, we get different results. So, um, so if we look at this same preference profile where D won on the points basis, E is a Condorcet winner because actually E beats A by 74 votes to 36, E beats B by 64 to 44, E beats C by 72 to 38, E beats D by 56 to 54. So E wins on the Condorcet method. Um, but if I look at all the other uh, voting systems. Okay, there's actually no winner if I just want a simple majority. I didn't talk about that one as much, but if you just say 50% of people have to put someone first for them to win, obviously that's often not going to give an outcome, but there's no, and that's exa exactly what happens here, no one has 50% of the votes. Under pl pl uh, plurality or first past the post, A wins because they have the most first choice votes, even though everyone else quite strongly dislikes them. Uh, under the runoff method, you can check here that B would win. Uh, under the alternative vote, you could check that C would win. And uh, under the points-based method, we saw that D would win, and as a Condorcet winner, we've seen that E wins. So actually, you know, here's a, a problem with designing voting systems. You know, I've got this preference profile, and you know, I've got five, you know, six different voting systems and six different possible outcomes, even though there are only five candidates in this election because nobody winning is a possibility. 
So uh, really the rules of the voting system really can determine the outcome uh, of the election. So that's why you know it's so important you know that when people have these uh, when we had the referendum about the alternative vote it really would have a huge impact uh, on the voting system if that had been adopted you'd have seen uh, probably parties like the Liberal Democrats get a lot more seats compared to the main two parties in British politics um, so uh, and you could apply you know similar arguments to other voting systems around the world of course so um, now, uh, I've put this quote in because I thought it was quite an interesting one to finish on here. Uh, something that Donald Trump said, and I don't usually uh, don't, don't agree with everything that Donald Trump says, of course, uh, but here is something uh, that he said that was reasonably sensible. He said, remember we won the election, we won it easily. You know, a lot of people say, oh, it was close. And by the way, they also like to talk about the Electoral College. Uh, okay, you can read the rest of the quote. The main point I've highlighted here is, he says, it's as though you're running. If you're a runner, you practice for the 100 yard dash as opposed to the one mile. So a lot of people said that when Donald Trump won the election, it was unfair because he didn't win the popular vote. Actually, Hillary, Hillary Clinton won more votes than he did in that general election. Uh, but the voting system is as it was, and so um, so he prepared in that way. And that's the same thing you can argue in the UK. OK, we've got first past the post, so people should vote tactically, perhaps, based on that. Uh, and you know, candidate, you know, candidates and parties are going to campaign, and we know that campaigning has a huge impact on elections. So, you know, you can't really look at the results of an election without also knowing the voting system. Okay, uh, Donald Trump here will say, "Well, you know what? I won the election because I knew it was this system, and that's how we campaigned, and that's how we won, how, how we ran the, how we ran our campaigns." Right? If it had been a, if it had been a system based on the popular vote, uh, he'd have campaigned differently, and it's very open for him to say that. Okay. So I'm not talking about politics here. I don't want to talk about, you know, uh, anything politically apart from the um, the mechanisms of the systems here. Um, but it's an interesting point, you know, that uh, okay, we, I can look at previous uh, results of elections and say, well, if uh, alternative vote had been used, a certain party would have won a lot more. And you know, argue, and I'm sure you know the Greens and, uh, and other smaller parties would get more under those systems. But you never really know, you know, it might actually be that the voting system changes the way people vote. So, uh, so you've got to bear that in mind and changes how people campaign. So, um, I'm going to pause this video here and we're going to do a second video uh, where we look at Arrow's impossibility theorem. So watch out for that one coming next. Um, this is a theorem that effectively says there are limits on a voting system and actually, uh, you know, however well you design a voting system, it can't satisfy uh, a couple of fairly simple criteria unless it's a dictatorship where effectively one person can control uh, all of the voting. So I'll explain that a lot more in the next video. Um, do put something in the comments below if you've got any questions uh, or want to respond to this video and hopefully I'll see you for the second part of this uh, very soon.